<laughs> okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. So, um, I guess we'll introduce ourselves first. N normally, when I kind of do a panel, I'd spend a bit of time planning ahead, but I figured we'd just do like a fireside chat and roll with it, depending on who's in the room. But should we introduce ourselves first? Paul, do you want to kind of background on how you ended up, where you ended up, and what you do? How I ended up? Um, yeah, as, uh, my name's Paul Arnold. Um, I'm a &R for Ultra Music Publishing. I do a and on records as well, but the main focus is why I was brought on to work with the Ultra is to grow the publishing catalog in Europe. Um, how I got there, I have been in music all my life. I run record labels, I've promoted club lights, I've DJed, um, and actually one of the only things I wasn't doing was publishing, which is why it was of interest to me. I'd kind of released lots of people's music. I'd, I'd run several record labels, and all the artists grew and went off and did their thing. I had DJ agencies, and all the DJs would grow, and other DJs' agencies would take them from me. And, uh, you know, I saw all these artists were leaving me, and I thought publishing maybe was a good way of um, working with an artist and, you know, having a value, you know, with, my, with what I do and with what they do when they went on and beyond, I would still have some sort of uh, ownership with them and the work that I'd done. And uh, <clears throat> ultimately, I did some work with uh, Domino Publishing, I did some work with Ryko Publishing, and eventually, um, yeah, through all the dance music that I was doing, Patrick Moxie, who runs Ultra Music, uh, he yeah, brought me on to his team. Amazing. Um, so I'm Mark Lawrence, I, uh, I run Black Rock Publishing, and we set that up in about 2013. Um, literally set it up in the lounge as a specific dance music publisher. And I think we were very fortunate. You always have these tipping point moments. And, and our, our first key signing within a month was Felix the House Cat, which was lovely. And that, that was, it was great because that kind of gave us a trophy to say, well, we've got Felix to come on board. And so we've grown pretty quick since 2013. We're now up to about 1,300 artists, which is, which is good fun. And, and we've, we've done it in probably two different ways. We've, we work very closely with a lot of labels and management companies, so we sort of white label behind them. And we also launched a product, which and we're gonna, a new version of it comes soon, which is a, a deal that's 28 days long. So instead of tying people in for a long time, um, the predominant contract that we offer is 28 days, so you, and it will soon be an online product, so you can go online, set yourself up online, and basically DIY your publishing. Publish as much as you want for as long as you want. So it's been an exciting um, journey, and I think it's really interesting what you said about your background, that everything you've done apart from publishing is probably quite reflective of most producers and DJs. It, just, just to do the show of hands like we did earlier, who's a producer in the room? So this will be, and who's got a publishing deal? So there you go. So mm -hmm. Paul, why why do you think it is? Before we go into what is publishing, why do you think it is that producers very often uh, don't get publishing, aren't looking for publishing deals, haven't joined PRS and and looked after their rights? It's simply just not the first thing they think of doing, is it? They they think of uh, writing the music, getting the label, putting it out, yeah. and it stops there pretty much, hoping that that will probably entail in getting them a gig somewhere. Yeah. So uh, publishing is always at the back of the mind, I think. And, and if you're young, you, you maybe not even know the publishing is even there. They, they, you may not know that there's a royalty from the publishing side as well as the, the record side. It's, it's kind of like a lost bit of hand-me-down information. If you're, if you're in a band, if you're in rock, pop, indie, there's normally someone around that's joined PRS or has a publishing deal from years before in your circle that goes, oh guys, before you do anything else, before you play a gig, go and register here, go and get this deal, go and do that, and everyone go, oh, yeah, all right, mate. And then all of a sudden, this check suddenly appears. Well, I think in dance music, there's like this little break in, in the generations whereby um, the, there isn't a manager getting involved until much, much later when it's probably too late, and everyone's sat in little basement studios producing, and the last thing that you do is have someone say to you, have you got a publishing deal? So. I guess maybe we should explore what is publishing. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with a couple of snippets about what the, the rights are, because it's, yeah. it's, it's a very jargon-heavy, complicated world that I guess all of us try and make simple, although some, of it make, some people make it more complicated to look clever. But how I've always described it is that if you can see or touch the music, then there's a mechanical right 
where there is a royalty. In other words, if your music's been copied or duplicated, then there is a mechanical royalty to collect. And if you can hear it, then it, the performing right is basically in place, which is your music is being performed in public. And when I say music, specifically your song, and that's, I think, where things get weird for dance music producers, because in the traditional music industry, there'll normally be some people writing a song in a room, and those people won't necessarily be the people that record it. So in the good old days, just to bring it to life, Lennon and McCartney would be sat in a room writing songs, and then at some point, the other two members of the Beatles would come in, and they would record the songs, and those would be sound recordings. So Lennon and McCartney wrote songs, Lennon and McCartney's songs got published. The Beatles recorded the songs and they signed them to the record deal. And why that's an important distinction is the record label paid the Beatles and the publishers paid the songwriters, Lennon and McCartney, which means that every single time the Beatles are covered, it's Lennon and McCartney that get paid, not the Beatles. The Beatles only get paid for the recordings that they made. And that's about the simplest way I've ever been able to describe publishing. Is there anything, is there anything else to add to that? Um, I think, uh, do you know, uh, obviously, uh, NWA, the Straight Out of Compton film, was a good, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but uh, was it um, Easy e He wrote, wrote a lot of it, and he went on to take the publishing side, so he was getting paid a lot more than uh, yeah. the, the guys who were just producing the, then the record, the, the sound, so um, that's a good way, another good thing to tap into, and you can sort of see how it works there. And from your perspective, either as ultra or as an individual, what is it that a publisher does? Um, from my perspective, what does the publisher do? Uh, well, I'll, I'll go back a bit. Um, I, when I was running my own record label called Certificate 18 Records, um, uh, I signed some artists, I put loads of records out, five-piece finals, lots of CDs, um, and I think they were registered with MCPS, but it wasn't until or maybe they weren't registered with the MCPS as a label. The label's got to do, really do, that, do their due diligence, register everything so the writer can get paid the mechanical. But all the guys went on to get uh, publishing deals and then they all came to collect their mechanicals from me. And actually, um, it's actually what I, why I had to shut my label down because I, I, w I wasn't fully aware that I had to pay this money out. Or I, ha I was aware, but I hadn't put a reserve there to kind of to pay them out. So that was my first sort of entry into publishing and knowing what publishing was about. And at that point, I just thought, okay, they, they collect mechanicals for artists, um, which is one, one thing that they do um, from CDs and vinyl and, and downloads and streaming as well. But having, as I've moved into it and started working for Ultra, I've learned that there's a much more creative side to it. Um, I think a good publisher can be like having a, a good manager. Uh, and more, more than that, you know, maybe the, like you were saying earlier, the publishing becomes, comes first before anything and they can help grow you as, a, as an artist, as a songwriter, as a producer, which may help you get a great manager. Yeah, and I think it, it, it's worthwhile then dwelling a little bit on why it's really important for you as a producer right now in, in your career, if you don't have, have a deal or if you haven't joined these mythical organizations called performing right organizations to do it now because we, dance music producers kind of break the music industry conventions of there's a songwriter in one room and then there's the artist in another because you're, you're normally sat in a room being all of those things at the same time. So the minute that you've finished that track and it's good to go and ready for mastering, you've been a songwriter, you've been a producer, an engineer, a recording artist, and lots of other quite mythical parts and roles within the music industry. And that, that's kind of slightly different. Uh, hip hop and R&B are probably more, more similar to it. So before you even shop your track to a label, that track or musical work or composition or song, depending on which piece of jargon you want to use to describe it, needs to get protected and needs to get ready to earn income. So if we just assume that you're able and have got a publishing deal straight away. The first email you should send when it's finished is, dear Mr. or Mrs. Publisher, this is my song. These are the percentages of, of if there's more than one person and the percentage of that song written by who, please get it on the system. Or if you've got an online publisher, go and register it. Because if you go and play in a club tonight and you play that track and that club is licensed by a performing right organization, your set list when you register it means that you'll get some money back for that. 
E equally, if it's on the radio, equally, you know, if it's on SoundCloud now, if it's on YouTube, wherever you put it now, you can be pretty certain that however small, there will be a royalty that's due to you. But that royalty is going to go nowhere near you unless you register your track and get a publishing deal. And the reason I think that's really important is that if you think about it in a, a typical underground dance music label, let's say you're lucky enough to get a 50-50 deal in that record contract. The next thing that'll happen in the small print is all the deductions of costs that come off your 50%, so it'll be mastering, artwork, promo, whatever else. And if you think that it's a few thousand downloads to get to number one on Beatport, and it's probably 20 downloads to get to number 50, doing the maths pretty quickly tells you that a ho an awful lot of record contracts aren't gonna pay you a lot of money. But if your track is is being performed on the radio or in a gig, you will more than likely, in the first part of your career, earn more money from the publishing than you will from record sales. And if you, so if you don't do, you're missing out on income that you can put back into your craft. And like, like Paul was saying earlier, getting your image and your brand right at the start, getting your mates to help you with design, getting your mates to help you with you know, ears on the track, getting your Facebook promotion right, some of that costs money. So the earlier you can start earning money, the better. And that's why publishing is so important. It might seem like something you shouldn't do till later, but I think we would both say get in there as early as possible. But of course, there are also very, very different publishers and Ultra are a particularly strong publisher when it comes to that next stage of career, I think, which is the creative and the sync and, yeah. and the top lines, which is another. But, but um, with that, registering your, your tracks from the very beginning, if you are just, if you are a DJ producer, or just producing, not DJ, it doesn't matter, but just a producer, you are 100%, you have 100% of that copyright. If you didn't sample anything, it's all your own music. And 100% is 100%. You, you know, you're, there's a good chance of you're going to earn money out of that. Because later on, probably as you evolve and get bigger as a DJ producer, you will probably start collaborating and you're doing something with someone else and there'll be 50%. And then you might have a singer on there, so he goes down to 33%. And then, you know, the splits can go right down. You may sample something, you may not get anything. So those first tracks you write, if you're registering them at 100%, you know, the will create a royal tree, and it's a, they call it a long tail. You know, if you end up having a hundred tracks with a hundred percent on, you've, you know, over time, as you maybe your releases get bigger and bigger, your old tracks will still get listened to, and from Spotify and wherever else, and so they will they will bring you revenue, and it will start to add up. So with that first track, as you said, get it registered through a publisher at 100% if it is 100%. But also, as a producer, when you're writing, you're, you're writing this tune, you're putting it in a hard drive, you're writing another tune, it's going on a hard drive, you're writing another tune, this one goes to a label, all of a sudden you've got 10 tunes, you've kind of lost track of where they've gone. But if you did it from the very beginning, that first track with a uh, publishing deal, with whoever, you, you're getting into the process of doing it. So each track you do, each track you're just putting on the hard drive, you're registering at the same time, you know, it's being done as you go along because five years down the road and many people that we sign haven't done this and they go to the hard drive, they've got 100, 200 to 1,000 tracks just sitting there. I'm like, well, you know, well, I'm like, you know this is great. This, this, you know, we will register them all, but they have no idea on what they are and they can't find them. It just becomes really complicated. So doing everything from the beginning is, is really important because every one of those tracks is an asset it's something you've made, it's your piece of art, it's your copyright, and to us, we can help create a revenue for you. But you have to have it, your, your sort of ducks in order before we can, we can do that. Yeah, and, and a really good point about the unreleased music as well, because publishing unreleased music is really important for two reasons, but the primary reason is that a publisher isn't just a business that puts your tracks in a system and chases down royalties. They will also push your tracks creatively for use elsewhere, which is something I know that Ultra are very strong on, and that's the, this kind of the, the mythical um, synchronization or sync deals, as they're called. There was a great presentation at IMS Ibiza um, with three of the really super sync agents, and one of the uh, ads that they showed was, I think it was Microsoft, but I might be wrong, and it was a gaming ad, and it's a fantastic piece of music for about a minute, it was a, quite a long advert. And the guy whose music was used, I think it was an unreleased track, it was about the third track he'd ever made, and I think the sync value was over 100,000 euros. 
So it was pretty significant. Lucky man. <laughs> so the next thing he did when that happened was resign from his job, invest in a studio, and spend the next two years making the music that he wanted to make. So, and that all came from the fact that he got a publishing deal and was publishing unsigned tracks and then giving those unsigned tracks to his publisher to work, not just sending them to a label. So if you're making music that's not always targeted at labels, but you're being creative and making other music, that could have a very high value to you as well. Do you, do you want to explain a little bit about Sync and how that operates and the intricacies of, of getting Sync deals and how they're negotiated? A little bit. Um, <clears throat> I have a, I'm an ultra, I'll talk about ultra on the sync side of things. We have a, a sync team in LA, there's about four, four staff, and they do about, uh, last year they did over 800 syncs. Everything from small online kind of uh, placements to uh, computer games to film to trailers. Um, I, when I'm, I work in London, the sync team in LA, when I, have a, when I sign someone on the publishing, we register all their music, it goes into the system, so it gets delivered to the sync team, and I run through a, this, this artist, this writer with the sync team, and they then become familiar with the music, that, or the, the artist that I've just signed. And it, then it takes, you know, then they, they made feedback to me and say, well, you know, it's not particularly sync friendly for whatever reason. I mean, you could say 4-4 four, four house music isn't particularly sync friendly, or to the sync person isn't particularly sync friendly. But the writer, the producer, wants to get the sync. He wants to get the £100,000 TV ad. So we then for, use that information that the sync team has given me to back to the producer and say, look, well, what about chopping up this track you know, building it up with a, a five-second build and a, a you know an inst a instrumental drop here and then a, a roll out here and turn it into a two-minute edit or a, a one one and a half-minute edit. And he's already got his tunes that may be out on the label or may, you know that are already done, but he can edit them and then feed them back, and then it becomes you know more interesting for our sync team to use. Um, and they come in different ways. I mean, the sync team then can go and pitch. To every, the briefs that they get in. Sometimes the, they, the sync team send me the briefs and I send it out to my writers if it's a particular sound, if they do want some sort of, a, uh, you know, tropical sounding, you know, that's going to be on a, a track that's going to go on a Lilt advert or something. Then, you know, I, I, as an A&R person, I will know the writers that I've signed. I generally will know their catalogue. To, but to go even deeper in it, I will then send my, that email to my writers and they'll know within their thousands of tracks on their hard drive that they've got one which sounds tropical that might be right for this, uh, you know, little advert. So then it will come back and it will go back to the sync team and, you know, they'll pitch. And it is, you know, some, it's kind of luck of the draw. But you can't get a sync if all your music is just on your hard drive in your computer. So if you give it to a publishing deal, they have a, a sync team who can then start sharing it and put it out there. And it's a case of just pushing, 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 knocking, get it sent out all the time. And, you know, ultimately, I think eventually something, you know, I've, um, with me, I've I had two labels, uh, Certificate 18 and Fat Records, just before I started with Ultra. I released, um, I think I said earlier, about 30 albums and over about 212 inches. And I got one really massive sync. At the time, it was about 20 years ago, I think it was worth 25 grand. So to me, that was huge. So, I mean, they are there, you know. Absolutely. And, and also, the, you know, not sync isn't all about getting music in films and adverts. You can also there's other, lots of other revenue sources. We've we've had a, a few runs of luck at much much smaller level of income aside from the film and TV, where which is things like in store music, uh, music on apps. We've just synced um, a lot of music into a new a new rowing app, believe it or not, where where you kind of go in, put your distance in, put the environment in, and then it selects the music to accompany your rowing according to the BPM. And they were just like, you know, we want 100 tracks, these these ranges of BPMs, all like this, and we just did a little blanket deal, as they call like one fee, and you can have all of this music, because we had both sides, which is, we had control of the masters and of the publishing as well, and I think, you know, that went out, uh, uh, I think it was a £5,000 deal, and it was spread across the music, but for each individual artist receiving that check, in quite a lot of cases, because they were relatively unknown tracks, the payment from that was greater than the payment from the labels that they sign them to. E equally, we've, we've been fortunate enough to get tracks into Adidas in-store as well. And all of these payments all add up. 
And so I think that's why it's really important. And we keep echoing the point, really, which is if, if get that habit right at the beginning. You know, if there's one thing you do as a producer today is go out and, and seek publishers, understand them, understand the difference between them, and also understand what a performing right organisation is, because that's probably something we should touch on about what they are and whether or not you should be published before you join one of them. So just to elaborate a little bit, who knows what a performing right organisation is? Even, even less than publishing, I think, which is, which is quite amazing. So performing right organisations, so PRS in the UK or ASCAP in North America, are organisations that look after songwriters as their members and they collect money on their behalf and they also therefore collect money for the publishers. And there's, I think there's 246 of them all around the world and they all do relatively similar things but in massively different ways, um, at massively different rates with massively different complexities. And you can't join all of those, but what they do is they, they collect your performing and mechanical right, but you normally have to pay to join and you have to do all of the work in terms of registering and then you will get paid every three months, six months or year for the use of your music. What a publisher does is say, don't worry about registering in all, in all of these different countries and relying on one of them to work with all the others. Give us your music, we'll take a percent, and then we'll register it all directly, we'll make all of the claims, we'll aggregate all the payments from all of those 246 societies, and we'll pay it to you, as well as making sure that we look for the creative. So you can see why it, it's becoming more common for people to go for the publishing deal first, because that's taking all of the sweat out of it for you, because you're being looked after globally, rather than just in the country that you're in. Now, once your, once your revenue starts to flow, I think all of us would advise that you then get yourself a, a membership with a performing right organisation because then half of your performing income is paid directly to you and, and half of it goes to the publisher to split according to their, to their, um, to their deal with you. So, but again, there are other people that say join directly. It's a personal decision. Um, I think my view these days for dance music is, is publisher first, performing right organisation second, but that might be controversial. There's others that would say it the other way around. Do you, do you have a fixed view on it, or do you think it's up to the individual? Um, yeah, up to the individual. It's actually, when I look at it, if they are registered, it, it often means everything's in order. Everything's, they've already started registering, and you can actually then quantify what they're kind of earning as well from what they've been doing. So... Uh, but you know, at the very beginning, it's it's yeah, it goes either way really. But I, I, I publisher or or a collections, you should definitely do one of them at the very beginning. Absolutely. So I mean, I'm I'm, I'm keen, I guess, to, to to take questions from the audience as well for both of us because yeah. we could probably go on for a while, but we'll we'll end up going into dark, deep holes of data and rights and impenetrable language about stuff. So I mean, I'm sure we'll pick up anything. But has anyone got any questions so far they'd like to ask us? Don't worry about what, how, what that question is, how complicated or simple it is, because I know it's a dark place to be in publishing. Yes. Hold on. We've both got music-induced hearing damage, remember? <laughs> um, how, how do you find the right publisher for yourself? Million dollar question. Good question. Um, Look around, yeah. Um, I mean, what is working out what you, what sort of music you do? What do you want to achieve? Um, do you, are you just a producer who is releasing on labels, or do you want to um, evolve out of that and become a you know a writer as well? Are you, are you just a producer who's writing your own artist project, or do you want to then go on and produce with other artists? So there may be a publisher who will just kind of work with you on the level of, uh, well, collections and sync, and that may be it, and that may be enough for you. Um, that's all you need, someone to, who's going to collect for you and do the sync side of it. You may want a, a much broader sort of palette with a publisher, um, and, and, you know, you want them to develop you as a writer, so you want them to put you into sessions. They want, you, want them to take, you want them to take you to writing camps. I mean, next, next month we have ADE, the Amsterdam Dance Event, and Ultra host a week-long writing camp. So we take our published writers to Amsterdam, we fly them in, put them in the studios for the week, and then we work with sub-publishers of ours in, in Amsterdam, and, and they bring in their writers, and then we look at the big, long list of DJs and producers and artists that are playing, and we hopefully try and get one of those guys in the room um, to work with our writer and then our sub-publishers' writer, so three of them. But, but 
that. So I guess if you then spend time, I guess find out, look in the directory of all the different publishers and try and just have meetings with them. Just try and, and ask them what they do, what level to what they do. Do they do sing? What, what are their collections like? Do they collect direct from uh, the territories they're in? Who are their sub-publishers in different territories? Um, do they have studios? Uh, you know, who would, if I signed to you, who would I be talking to? Who's my point person? Is there a kind of A&R guy in here that will look after me? Will he help hook me up with sessions or other songwriters or other producers? Will he send me songs that I need for my tracks? You start thinking about what you need, have a, a bunch of questions, and if you're not sure, ask, ask other, you must know other DJ producers, artists who have publishing deals, ask them what they get from their publisher. You know, what services do they offer? And just, just build all those questions and then take them into the different publishers and, and get the answers and whoever you think is going to give you the best personal service to, for a, your needs. It's a good one as well. It's something I didn't ask earlier. Uh, uh, ultra music publishing, do you typically publish artists that already have momentum in their career? So are you interested in people that are already on the upward curve rather than those that are on their first track or do you cover that whole spectrum? You cover the whole spectrum. Yeah. It's purely talent based. It's purely if they're like, you know, if you're a songwriter who writes amazing songs and they send us the first song that is just out of this world because it's original lyrically, it's really interesting, we would definitely look at signing them. The same with a, a producer, if they send us a track and it was just like out of this world and they haven't even started yet, we would definitely sign them. And you know, maybe we wouldn't sign them for a whole bunch of money because they haven't got anything out there, but what they're actually signing to us for is the resources that we can then add to their project to help grow it, move it forward. So um, hopefully it's kind of a win-win on both sides yeah. at that point. But yeah, my boss would lovely to sign. You know, artists that have huge <laughs> records that run published are gonna make him loads of money as well. So. Yeah. I mean, we deliberately, have just kind of put our business into two sections. So we have the existing black rock business, which is very much boutique, high-end, working kind of like you've described with Ultra, look, looking and account managing, delivering a personal service, relationship-led, creative-led for, for a, a small number of writers stroke artists. And then we're just in the throes of launching um, a new site called centricelectronic.com, which is basically a publishing service where you go online, register your, to get an account online, and then administer it yourself. All the back-end services in terms of collections are the same. It's just that with, with, with BlackRock, we kind of lean forward and work very proactively with the artist. Centric Electronic is kind of like the scale, entry-level publisher so that you can get used to publishing. And, um, and so that's kind of how we've, we've segmented our business deliberately. Yeah, I think this is quite interesting, actually, because we're two very different publishers, aren't we? So Ultra Music, for example, a, s a standard publishing deal that I would do, you came to me as a producer and I thought you were really good, at, and you wanted to do a publishing deal, I wanted to do a publishing deal with you, it would probably be a three-year deal um, with an advance or without an advance. If there was an advance, if we didn't recoup within the first year, there'd be an extension for another year, and if we didn't recoup within that year, there'd be an extension for another year. That's pretty much it. So you're not like signing your life away. You could be out of that deal within the very you know, the latest five years, which goes like that. You know, it could be the very beginning of your career, but it could have given you all the steps you needed to get to the next point. But that's but that yeah, that's our deal. I mean, obviously we have advances and stuff like that. But then when you have a team and everything, but yeah, your deals are you yeah, say the, the, 30, yeah, the, the 30 Central days. Electronic deal is is a rolling 28 days. 80, 20, 28 days, publish as you go, you know, and if you don't come out of that deal, it just keeps going for 28 days, 28 days, 28 days. So it's, it was very deliberate for new and developing artists to come in, be published, but not feel like they were tied into something and equally be available for a, a big creative deal later. Mm. So kind of like you, we've got, we've got the high-end deals, sim very similar structure, but this kind of entry-level piece is really interesting because our, our, I guess our drive is to have all the hands in the room saying I'm published every time we go to a conference rather than say who's published and you know, two hands go up because for me it's a passion piece as well to make sure that everyone is published be it with us or with anybody. It's, it's kind of depressing at an industry level to see 
um, how low the publishing rate is for, for producers. And we should probably make a mental note to talk about contracts before the end of this and things to avoid. Well, I was just like thinking of that when you mentioned it and you, your question, again, asking, who, you know, how do I find the publisher for me, being two very different ones. You may be an artist who has, you know, you've got no money to, to kind of to pay a lawyer to come in and do a big deal. I mean, an ultra deal would be a, a fairly hefty contract. It's a three-year term deal with an advance and no advance, and it's actually an American company, so the law is slightly different. Um, you know, you, you know, you may not just be able to afford to do a publishing deal because we send you the contract and you can't get it looked over properly. Um, whereas maybe Centric, it's a 30-day deal. I, I imagine, and I think I know, that the contracts are a lot lighter um, you could probably take it to a colleague, a friend, who may be law, may not be music law, or could look over and go, yeah, this is pretty safe. Or you could find someone who's also done a deal with Centric and know that they're rolling. If, you, if you're rolling 30 days, you know, it there's... Doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is, you're you out can, in 30 you, days. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you can sign it. You, if you know what it really meant, you'd sign it because you, ultimately you could leave and you would know that all your stuff is getting, all your songs are, are being protected, they're getting collected against. And as you mentioned, if then you had the hit and uh, you were just collecting and doing what you do then, and I came along, go, I want to sign a publishing, oh, he's already published. He said, oh, well, I can get out of 30 days. I said, great. After 30 days, you got out of the deal, um, then you could go and do a deal with, say, Ultra, or you know, maybe a major publisher would come in and give you, you know, 100 grand on the back of this hit. Centric does real-time feed a deal with Ultra Music Publishing and IMS Malta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Well, there are so that, you know they're, they're very different publishers to, to work with, and also um, yeah, again I'm talking of Ultra. Ultra is New York based. We collect, so we but we have we have offices in in America. Um, I'm a creative in uh, the UK, and there's another one of me. We have a studio in the UK. We have a creative team in Germany. We have a creative team in Italy, but we also have sub publishers because we um, we. Don't we collect at source in America, but we let like Sony ATV, who are a publisher in the UK, they collect for us in the UK. We have um, Cloud9 and the Benelux who collect for us in Holland and Belgium. So they collect all these, uh, all the mechanicals and all the performance for us, and they feed it back to us, and then we pay the artist. But what's good for us working with the sub publishers is when I have a, say, a, a producer DJ who's playing in Belgium, he's doing a gig. But he wants to go in, he wants to work. I can talk to my sub publisher and say, Who's in town or who have you got on your books? And I can maybe hook him up with a session with a, another great DJ producer who lives in Belgium. So that's where we again come into our own sort of work, um, working creatively. But some publishers may collect at source yep. directly. Um, so they will be maybe based in any countries and they'll just collect from Belgium, they'll collect from Sweden, they'll collect from America. So they may not actually have people who you can work with creatively in these countries. So uh, that's something to think of as well. Absolutely, yeah. And when we deploy that model with, with Centric Electronic, it's direct into 12 key territories. So that it's just straight in exactly the difference. So I think we probably answered that question a bit. <laughs> it was pretty cool, thank you. Great. Any other questions? I know some other hands went up. Ask, ask anything. Yeah, thank you for passing the mic. It's in the haircut. Um, I want to ask about uh, releases. If I have already released something from a uh, label, can I release it again? Is it possible to change the label if I've already uh, you know, made a deal with the label? No, because like you've made a deal with the label. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, in essence, unless your contract says you can have your master rights back within three months and four months later you can give it to someone else but most most record contracts will state a term that you're signing it away to you're effectively giving ownership to the record label and it becomes theirs their copyright not yours so you can't you're, you are restricted from what you can do with it from that moment on and most labels these days are either 5 10 20 or life i think in terms of years so be, when you're signing a record deal and when you're signing a publishing deal look out for words like term and look out for words like perpetuity and look out for words like post-term retention and all of these lovely wonderful legal terms that are effectively ways of taking what you've made off you for as long as possible uh, so it's maybe more uh, better to 
do it all by yourself, so you don't risk anything. Well, I think well, it's not a risk. I think if you if you make your own music and you have ten followers on Facebook and twelve on SoundCloud and you release it yourself, you're not going to sell much, sent or, or distribute much. So the the point of of signing to a a record label is they're going to promote your music and they're going to promote it to their audience and their fan base. So if you're lucky enough to sign to Defected, every Monday when they send an email round to every single person that subscribes to Defected, which is probably a mailing list now of, I would guess, over a million probably, but certainly well into the high hundred thousands, if 10% of those people pressed play on Spotify or download on Beatport, you would make money despite the fact that you've signed a contract that says you've given it to Defected for 20 years. Whereas if you woke up on Monday morning and put your track up on SoundCloud, how are you going to get anyone to hear it? So that, that's the, basically the strategy of self-release is you're going to have to invest in building a fan base, which is going to cost money. You're going to have to work your socials. You're going to have to have an identity. You're going to have to have a PR campaign. You're going to have to do all the work that a label does for yourself. And that's really easy to do if you're Calvin Harris. He could give up signing to record labels tomorrow, go direct to Spotify and be happy as Larry. But I think an, a, a starting producer, when you think there's 26,000 tracks a week going on to Beatport, then you think of all of the tracks that are just edits and unauthorized edits that are appearing on SoundCloud. There's probably, I would hazard a guess, 100,000 dance tracks a week probably appearing in all their different forms in all the different sites around the world and you've got to compete with them. So I, I, you know, I'm not saying don't do it yourself, but be very, very clear about what do it yourself means because there's a lot of work and you've got to be really good at it. Paul, I mean, you, 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 can, uh, you can license, a label can license it to another label. If you uh, signed a record deal for the world with a label in, in say, England, and yet you were DJing in Australia for, you know, whatever, and you built up a bit of uh, hype and demand in Australia, and you, you thought there was an audience there, you could talk to the label and say, hey, look, I can think we can sell more records in Australia. Like, okay, well, you know, they could offer, if you found a label, they could turn to your label and license it. I mean, on the other hand, the label might go, okay, maybe we'll employ a, a PR to give it a bit of extra push in Australia. So you... You know, you can push things along. And, and also, you can combine the two approaches. And I think, I think we, we had a question like this, uh, another panel in, in Ibiza, which is, if you, if you do have a fan base, if you do have some support, then you can release on a label and then use that label's fan base to give you profile. And then your next release can be self-released on your own label because people will be following you then on SoundCloud, on YouTube, on Beatport, on Spotify. So it's all about driving audience numbers up so that whatever you do next, people will continue to follow and consume your music. So there's, there's now quite a lot of people that will release on their own label and release on other labels and keep those two things bouncing against each other. So ultimately they keep going. And the good news, of course, is the publisher that you work with is going to publish both of those. And so that's the kind of the win-win. And then I, I decide to have another music and then uh, instead to look for another label, just take a shortcut and release for the same label again if they have a good audience. Paul, Paul chime in, but I mean, it's particularly from an ultra perspective, but it, it depends on your music and your label and what you're trying to achieve. You know, should, there are artists that regularly release on Tool Room, for instance, that don't release on many other labels. They're not contracted to only release on Tool Room in most cases. I don't mm. know if Jamie's here, but he would probably chime in. But I think mo labels are kind of, and I think Manu and Carl talked about it earlier, there's like a, a pecking order, a ladder of labels, and you're, it's rare to go straight to the top. So you sort of start here, and then you have to kind of go, well, what's the next label up? What's the next label up? What's the next label up? What you shouldn't do is pepper your releases across lots of small labels because none of those are going to take your career much further. You've always got to be looking up. So some labels, I know Armada are doing tie-ins now where they're signing people for 10 releases exclusively because they really prize that artist, but you've got to make your way up to Armada. Uh -huh. Do you see what I mean? So it's looking at it like a ladder. And you've got to keep looking up to the next and the next. And if you're lucky, someone will say, I want you for 10. 
Yeah, I, I mean, there's no written rules anymore, and the, it is very different landscape to what it used to be when you'd sign exclusively to a label, and that would be it. You can control where you want to go completely, and I do kind of look at it almost like the pyramid. I mean, you could start out with releasing on 10 different labels, but I think they all have 10 different audiences. If they all had a 1,000 people on their mailing list, they go to the 1,000 people there. If you release a list, they'll go to a different audience. They'll go to a different audience. And so you could kind of spread it initially, reach a, a, bit, a you know, wide audience through a number of different labels. But then as you start to grow your audience, you kind of reduce that kind of, you know, maybe you only release to the five labels and you tie it up and then you go to the three and then you go to the two. And then, you know, then you go to the one where hopefully you're doing the, the bigger deal. They're going to invest probably a money in you, but then you're going to have the resources that that label brings, whether it be a major label or a, you know, a bigger, bigger independent. Another, uh, uh, just another point, it's about uh, when we're going to look for record labels, of course, first we go to see, we're going to see all the big ones because they're more exposed for us. And then uh, sometimes you go and uh, we subscribe for them, we send demos, and usually they don't reply. <laughs> that, that's what happens because they get a lot of demos and uh, do you think it's nice for us like to ask and for the reply or we just keep going and send for another one? Because for me, like, when I, w what I do, it's like uh, uh, when, I, when I produce a music, I produce a music and I go and look for one uh, record label that fits my music. I don't go to send for all of those, you know, like I go for one record label that I see like, okay, this music fits on that and I think it, I can do it. So, but usually it's, it happens like that. Like that. Well, let, let's actually bring it sort of back. We've been talking about records for a while. Let's sort of bring it back to the publishing. Maybe if you brought in a publisher at this stage, they could help you find a label. That's, that's what I do uh, with the writers who sign to me. Um, so maybe if you start looking for a publisher, and again, there are many out there, and you find the right one, you think they're going to work for you, it may be... Uh, a publishing deal where there's, there's no money, it may be a 30-day thing, it may be a, a, a three-year term, or it may be longer than that. But if you find the right one and, and you think that they can work for you and help you, ultimately the publisher needs you to release records to earn any money. It needs the records to be played by the DJs, it needs to be, whether it be released still on a, on a vinyl or whether it's um, uh, you know, played on the radio, is that will then bring in the, the, the performance and the, the, the money to come back to you, which the publisher can collect for you. Um, so yeah, I think a publisher is intrinsic in finding a good label, and it can also probably has the better, has the contact at the big label that you want to reach, who never Absolutely. answers your emails. Yeah, if you if you go on to I think it's beatstats.com, which is a website that ranks by order top selling artists on Beatport, top selling labels, and top selling tracks. And I think you can do it by genre, so you can go like, what are the top 100 selling labels on Beatport? I, I could probably guarantee you two things. One, the top 20 labels probably don't get round to answering more than 20% of the emails in their demos inbox. Some of them only have it there because they know they need to have it and they will only really accept demos from people they know. Um, and good publishers, and we do the same thing, will cut straight through to the person they need to speak to and go, oh, I got one for you, you need to listen to this one, and the label will go, cool it's come from you, of course I'm going to. And the great thing is, they'll then give feedback and say, hey, Paul, thanks for sending that one through. It's not quite right for us, but if that could change and that could change and you could get someone to sing, you know, put a good hook on it or a full song on it, then we'd be really happy to listen again, which you'll probably never get from most of the top labels from their demo inbox, I would think. And that's, that's another powerful thing, I think. I guess you could sort of play devil's advocate, but I mean, to get... Uh the a and the publishing companies to listen to your, your demos is also a thing, as well as the labels. But I mean, there are, this is why conferences like this happen, and this is why ADE happens, and all these music conferences, if you can't get the replies on the, on the emails, it's about you know, going and meeting these people face to face, and we are all humans, and we do get the emails, and we do talk, and we can meet people. So you, know, there are, you, you can get through to the people, and then if you're not getting the responses you want, You've got to up your game. As simple as that. You know, it's about your product, so you really need to kind of get make that better for people to want to, to you know, to publish it or release it. That's like Carl B said earlier. I mean, Carl's had phenomenal success. He's pretty much released in all the labels that he wants to release, bar two in the last year. But it took him eight years to get that first track signed. 
But in the last two, he's kind of, he's just sat, go this, this one, you know, this is one for dynamic, this is one for Moon Harbor, this is this, this. And, it, and he's been single-minded single in getting it to the right people. Um, and and he'll, he'll, he knows that no's and knockbacks are an essential part of developing your skills as a producer. So don't get disheartened, keep focused, but also don't, don't kind of send it, we talked about it earlier, don't send all, don't send one demo to 15 labels at the same time, don't send it to 200 A&R contacts all on open CC because they're like, that's the immediate delete. You know, make it personal, make it careful. As you do, research the label, see that it fits and be really careful about how good that email is because that email with a demo, that's your job interview. If your first impression is awful, you fail the interview. They won't listen to the music. Yeah, um, building a relationship with someone within that field. I mean, lots of people hit me up directly on Facebook Messenger. I have no idea who they are. Unfortunately, I can't get time to answer them all. But there's someone who just hit, you know, just talk to as many as I can and give them as much advice as I can. I, you know, people will if they can. So uh, just gotta don't do it on a Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't send demos on a Monday morning. Um, is there any sort of more questions in in the publishing and? Any, anything we've touched on that you might not be sure about? Uh, who, would, who would collect the mechanical rights? Like, for example, who would pay for them? Say your, your song is played at the club, right? Which is licensed and is played. Who actually pays that money to the writer? From where does the money come from? From the club, from the producer, from, yeah. from the DJ? So the club pays a performing right organization an amount of money a year for the use of music in that nightclub. And then that performing right organization pays publishers or direct member writers. Um, and it takes that lump of money for the year and divides it over the songs that have been reported. So that's why reporting set list is really important. So if you have a publishing deal, your publisher will pay you. And if you're a direct member of a performing right organization, they will pay you as well. But for example, say, Despacito, right? It was played in clubs all around uh -huh. the world and sometimes five or six times a night. Yep. They would get six times the amount of that money. Because like if, if I have a song just played, it was played once in a night and that song was played six or seven times. That other song was played six times because it played more than mine, I imagine, right? Same as with a streaming, yeah. I mean, it, yes. I mean, it, there's really long, complicated answers to that question, which would take about three and a half hours to answer because not every track is paid per play, not every set list is reported, not every set list is paid properly. But if you assume the best case, which is that every track played in a nightclub on a night receives an amount of money each time it's played, then six plays would get more than one. But that's kind of the perfect world. In, in truth, a lot of performing right organizations take last year's top 100 and just pay the money out over that and won't even consider what was being reported actually or played on that night. So that's why it's, there's a very long, complicated answer. But yes, the more times your music is played, the more times you would get paid. Are there, um, <coughs> sorry, was there another? Do um, uh, publishing deals tend to be 360 deals when you sign an artist? So do the publishers then make the money from the merchandise that the artist sells and it's a 360 deal or not? Really? Typically. Uh, Go on, okay. um, I think the 360 deals tend to come more from the labels side of things. You go direct to a publisher, the publishers, are, are the, from what I know, they just, it's just publishing. I think labels, and it's interesting, I was going to bring this up earlier, actually talking about labels adding on publishing to their label contracts. Um, they do this because they can make more money collecting uh, publishing for you, but they're not necessarily giving you the creative uh, publishing team that you need, but maybe you just want them to collect for you anyway, so that's fine. But um, So a label would come for the track, for the recording, but then they may also, yeah, look at taking up the, the publishing for you, but then they also may, yeah, want to get some of your, the rights to your merchandise and your live. So I think you'll find it's more from the label side of it. Yeah, and it'd be quite hard, I think, for a publisher to get the rights to do it because they're publishing songs and writers, not recordings and artists. So you, you would, in what you've just described, they would be trying to pay Lennon and McCartney the merchandise income for the Beatles, and you just, that doesn't work. The line doesn't go from A to Z, yeah, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. 
Um, but yeah, I was going to just say that about labels picking up publishing. Um, how many of you have released a record on a, a label? A few of you. How many of you signed the publishing to that label at the same time? Actually, quite a few of you within the first hands that went up. Did you know what you were, did you know that they were taking the publishing as well? I mean, you were obviously cool with that. Anyone? Well, you understood the contract and you saw that the publishing was there also. Because actually, many people now, that if they're starting out, they may get the record deal and there may be the publishing written within the contract and they may just sign the deal not knowing that they're actually giving the publishing away. So that is something to look out for. That is really cool if the label do that and they collect the publishing for you and they pay that through, that's great. But you should just, as long as you're very aware that yeah, some labels will do that and you don't have to do that. You could take the publishing out of that agreement and just sign the record deal with the label, keep the publishing. You may not have a publishing uh, you know, uh, deal yet, but you could you know, keep that. You could register with the PRS or whatever and then, or not, and then do the publishing later. You might build up four or five tracks and then who haven't been published and then go and do a, a publishing deal with Ultra. You couldn't do that if you signed it over to the label yeah. because they have your publishing and they may have it for life. So yeah. again, looking at terms. And, the, and you know, it's a really good point and I, I've been quite vocal on this and sometimes I guess there's sort of a finger of hypocrisy pointing back the other way but I've always said there's label publishing and label publishing. Now we proudly work with Toolroom and Mobley and Snatch and others and we provide label services, publishing services to them as a label but once they're into us, we then do all the creative, we do what, what we do for direct artists for those because we're, we're, we're publishers, they're record labels and we have a partnership together that works for both parties. But I'm sure you've seen it, you get contracts come across and there's a little line on page 72 of the recording contract that goes, oh and we'll have your publishing as well. Doesn't talk about term, doesn't talk about rate, doesn't give you any idea about what you're signing up to, it's just hidden away at the bottom. And then you dig into that, and that, that label is literally just registering that track on PRS. It doesn't do anything else with it. doesn't re make sure it's registered around the world. doesn't pitch it for sync. doesn't do anything with it. It just hopes that by putting it on that system, they'll earn another 50 quid. And they won't even assure you they're going to pay you anything, because it's, it's a dangerous comment to make, but I would describe it as not real publishing. It's just collecting a bit more money for the label. So as Paul absolutely says... Stop and think when you see a label offering you publishing and ask them, well, who's doing the publishing? Is it you or is it a publisher? And if it is you, you know, talk to me how you do it. Ask the same questions of the label that you would ask a publisher. Which territories do you operate in? How do you collect it? Will you be pitching for sync? You know, and, and keep going from there. Because there, there are definitely labels out there, probably well intended, but, you know, it's like asking... You know, a hairdresser to, to kind of fix an engine, but mm. they don't know how to fix an engine. It's like they probably know that they should do something else to, to be better, but they don't know how to do it. Yeah, they're, they're very separate entities. I mean, if you look at all the ma majors in London, for example, like Sony Records, they have an office here. Sony ATV, you would have thought the publisher would have been together, but they're, they're totally separate. They don't work together. They, they could sign and have a hit record over here on Sony Records and it, they might, the publishing might be signed by you. I might have, Ultra might have the publishing. They're just completely separate entities. So in your mind, if you, if you look at it like that, I think that kind of helps as well. Absolutely. Any more questions? <laughs>